I wish that I felt the way that I do when I'm fasting all the time. And you know what I'm talking about. It feels good. You feel clear, you feel fresh. And quite frankly, that's what it would feel like to be walking around with modulated inflammation most of the time. If your inflammatory signals were a little bit less, that's probably how you'd feel because that tends to happen during a fast. But we can't fast all the time. But let's explain what's going on here and how you might be able to sort of extend that benefit so you feel good a lot of the time. I have five key ways from a biochemistry standpoint that fasting is modulating inflammation and it's pretty darn amazing. Let's dive in. We're gonna jump in with number one, which is the fact that fasting reduces pro-inflammatory immune cells. Okay, now there is some interesting research published in the journal Cell Metabolism. It took a look at subjects that underwent a 19-hour fast. That is a decent fast, and with this 19-hour fast, they found, wow, there was a significant reduction in circulating monocytes. Now, monocytes are basically like the quintessential sort of white blood cell immune cell that we know of, right? So it's pretty basic blanket term. Now, at first glance, you think, well, I don't necessarily want a decrease in circulating monocytes. That means that I have a decrease in my immune system. Well, yes, that is correct. But if you look the more details of the study, you realize, oh, in people that already had a low baseline of white blood cell or a low baseline of monocytes, it didn't do that. It didn't reduce their monocytes more. But people that had higher levels of circulating monocytes, i.e. higher levels of circulating inflammation, it definitely suppressed the monocytes and decreased the circulating monocytes, meaning that there was significantly a reduction in inflammation. Okay, well, let's dive in more because what exactly would these monocytes do? What's going on here? So what happens is when we have high levels of circulating monocytes, we have higher levels of what is called something kind of weird, CD14 and CD16. I'm just going to make it very simple here, but these CD14 and CD16 will bind to what are called lipopolysaccharides. So any kind of potential inflammatory thing or pathogen that would cross through our gut, basically our gut into our bloodstream, which sounds like only unhealthy to unhealthy people. No, it happens all the time. Basically, when you have high levels of circulating monocytes or even moderately high levels, it's going to bind to anything and everything that crosses through the bloodstream, triggering a small inflammatory reaction. Not what we want. That's why a lot of people feel like, man, as soon as I eat anything, it's like I'm sensitive to anything. I eat this and I inflame. I eat this and I feel brain foggy. Well, yeah, because it could be some gut barrier integrity going on there. Anyhow, point here is when you're fasting, you have this modulation or this decrease in the CD14 and CD16, which is thereby not sending this inflammatory signal as much. But why is this happening? Well, if you look further at additional research, you find that AMPK, okay, which is the energy sensor within the body. So when we're fasting, AMPK upregulates because it's a sensor that recognizes, uh-oh, there's no food coming in. So AMPK elevates to say, hey, we need to start kind of like using other energy, like stored body fat and stuff like that. So AMPK is like the messenger. Now when AMPK is activated, inflammation goes down. And they figured this out by actually pharmaceutically activating AMPK. When they pharmaceutically activated AMPK, they got the same result as if they were fasting and activating AMPK. So we know that that's one of the pathways. The other pathway has to do with PPAR, which is fat adaptation. So PPAR alpha is associated with adapting and utilizing fats as a fuel source, like when we're fasting. So that's just kind of more proof that being fat adapted attenuates sort of this monocyte activation. So living a more anti-inflammatory lifestyle, yeah, probably correlates with being more fat adapted. So that's kind of the first thing, major pro-immune system, right? But then we have to look at another piece, which is fascinating, and that has to do with what's called the NLRP3 inflammasome. This is number two. Inflammatory cytokines that trigger like just the inflammatory response where we feel foggy and inflamed and painful joints and stuff like that, they have to undergo processing before they actually sort of activate their pain within our body. So when they first leave, when they're first transcribed, when they're first expressed, they are in an unactivated form, okay? So it's like a, I want you to envision this. It's like when you buy an electronic, you know how sometimes you have to pull that little plastic tab out by where the battery is before the electronic will work? It's like you pull it out of the box, you have to pull a little plastic tab out and then it works. Okay, well, our pro-inflammatory cytokines are like that too, okay? They are somewhat dormant. They get activated, then they kind of leave, and then they get activated by something called caspase one. Caspase one, I want you to think of like the fingers that actually pull the plastic thing out. So once caspase one pulls the little plastic thing out or 
sort of dismantles the inflammatory cytokine, then it releases all its nasty stuff and makes us feel like garbage. So there's kind of this like potential at first and it's just there and then it gets activated and it sucks when it does. Well, caspase one, the piece that pulls out the plastic tab, is mediated by something called NLRP3 or the NLRP3 inflammasome. Well, here's where the science gets interesting surrounding ketones when we are fasting. The Journal of Nature Medicine published that ketones blunt the activation of the NLRP3 inflammasome to begin with. So that means when ketones are present during a fast, we don't have finger plucking. We don't have that. We don't have the activation of this, you know, pro IL-1 beta that it's called. And this all has to do with sort of the efflux of potassium out of a specific cell and everything. But that's, you know, biochemistry. We don't need to go into that. The point is we're blocking that from happening. We're blocking the activation. So we have two different avenues there. We have, of course, the modulation of the pro-inflammatory piece in the beginning, like the monocytes, the white blood cells. And then we also have not activating other cytokines. Okay, well, let's talk about another piece of inflammation, allergies. Have you noticed that when you're fasting, you don't feel the effects of allergies as much? I certainly have. Okay, where I live, we have like massive blossoming of flowers and green stuff, and it's beautiful. But I end up dreading it because I feel miserable. But when I'm fasting, I feel great. And then when I break my fast, it kind of comes back again. Well, what's going on there? Now, the trick becomes like trying to make sure that you don't totally turn this off aggressively when you stop your fast, right? You want to continue to feel the effects and feel like really good and fresh. And a lot of times if you eat right after your fast, like which you would, you're going to feel like the effects kind of go away. All of a sudden you're not feeling less inflamed. You're feeling inflamed again. That is one of the biggest reasons why I recommend breaking your fast with just protein first, okay? Because that way you're not bringing in all kinds of cattywampus weird things that are going to trigger all kinds of different histamine reactions and all kinds of different pro-inflammatory cytokine responses because you're bringing new food in. So keep it lean, keep it clean, keep it protein. That's what I always say. Okay? Lean, clean protein, nice and easy. Uh, what I usually break a fast with is Sun Warrior. It's a lean pea and hemp protein blend. That way I can just mix it with water or mix it with like simple coconut milk, something that's relatively anti-inflammatory to begin with. So I put a link down below. You can save 15% if you use that link on Sun Warrior. They're a tremendous supporter and sponsor of this channel. So a big thank you to them. But they're also just kind of like my go-to break fast strategy. And I've talked about that for years on my channel. So highly recommend there is a link down below. Check them out after this video if you're looking for something to easily break your fast with so that you can transition into introducing more foods as you go. So again, that link is down below in the description. You may not realize that allergies are an inflammatory response, but they absolutely are. And this is near and dear to me because where I live, it's beautiful, but I learned to kind of dread when the flowers start to bloom and when the trees start to blossom and everything, because that means that I'm on my butt with allergies because I've suffered from them, right? But I noticed that when I'm fasting, the effects don't hit me as much. So I wanted to dive into the research as to what's going on here. Well, it's really interesting. There's some preliminary evidence that's coming out now. The journal Nutrition and Metabolism published a study that really explained how this kind of works. You see, we have these things called mast cells. Mast cells are a part of our immune system. And the best way to describe them is when you cut your finger, like you can kind of see I did there, when you cut your finger, a mast cell, mast cells travel to the injury. Okay, and what happens is once the mast cells are there, they go through a process called degranulation. Okay, mast cells have these little granules on them. And when they go through degranulation, it breaks apart and it releases inflammatory mediators. These could be inflammatory mediators to increase platelet count, to improve scarring, but also one of those mediators guess what, is histamine. I'm sure you've heard of histamine before because you've probably taken an antihistamine. So one of those mediators is histamine. And it's just, it's involved in everything, lots of injuries, but it's exceptionally involved when it comes down to allergies. So let's put this into context with allergies for a second, how this works. Let's say you breathe in a bunch of pollen. The pollen, whether you like it or not, is a foreign invader. It is a foreign body, okay? What happens is you have a B cell response, part of your immune system. The B cells go and they react to the pollen, okay? And what that does is it produces what's called an IgE response, immunoglobulin E response, specific to allergies. And that kind of just activates this whole inflammatory system anyway. And then the IgE, the immunoglobulin E, binds to the mast cell. And it does that so that it sits on the membrane of the mast cell so that it can recognize if that pollen ever enters again. So it's been labeled essentially as a problem. This pollen is a problem. So then the second exposure, okay, then the body says, oh no, there's that pollen again and that hits the IgE that's on the mast cell, and guess what happens? Degranulation with the 
exceptional degranulation of the area that releases histamines. And there you go, boom. Nasal congestion, sneezing, watery eyes, achy joints, stiffness, painful back, whatever you name it, right? That is what's going on with allergies. So how does fasting mediate this? Well, there's some interesting research again that's showing that ketones stabilize mast cell degranulation, meaning our mast cells can sometimes like be hypersensitive and degranulate really fast. So when someone is hypersensitive to something or they have really bad allergies, a lot of times they have like too much degranulation that's occurring. When the mast cells respond, they're just like and releasing histamines everywhere. That's why you meet those people that are just allergic to everything. It's no fault of their own a lot of times, but that's just the way it can be. So ketones can stabilize that degranulation, meaning that it's going to make them less reactive to an allergen. That's fascinating because it means that you're attenuating that allergic response. But this can also play a part with like foods, right? You find you're sensitive to foods. You have a food intolerance. Well, it doesn't always have to do with histamines. Like you might find that fasting course corrects some of your food sensitivities because it's stabilizing the degranulation. And the question you're probably wondering, can you do this with a ketogenic diet too? Yes, because this is associated with, of course, ketones. But with fasting also, you're bringing in less things because you're not eating that would also be stimulating additional inflammation. So sometimes you have inflammation occurring that you don't feel, but it's putting you right up to that threshold. And then when you get to that threshold, then you feel it. So maybe you have inflammatory things from things that you're eating that are already pushing you right to that edge. And then all it takes is one puff of pollen to send you over that edge, right? So if you're kind of like decreasing your baseline, you have a lot more of your bucket to fill before you get to the symptomatic phase. Anyway, moving on. Then we have nuclear factor kappa B. This is one that I've talked about a lot and I'll keep it kind of simple because nuclear factor kappa B is complicated because it's involved with gene expression and the genetic world is complicated. But this would be, if I could say anything, the master regulator of inflammation, like the best way to put it. It regulates everything at a genetic level with inflammation. Remember that pro interleukin one beta that I talked about, that toy or that, that electronic that you have to plug the piece of plastic out of in order to get it to work? Well, nuclear factor kappa B is what makes that electronic in the first place. So rather than having an electronic floating around your body that's just waiting to get the plastic piece plugged, what if you just never created the electronic to begin with? See, that's what the inhibition of nuclear factor kappa B can do. Well, there's an interesting study published in Free Radical Biology and Medicine that showed that alternate day fasting can decrease the binding of nuclear factor kappa B to the DNA, meaning it's never expressing and creating again, for the sake of analogy, these electronics that would have to get their little plastic thing plugged. So you have no or less inflammatory little like cells floating around in the first place. The last one that I wanna talk about, number five, is neuroinflammation. Sure, ketones are good for the brain. They fuel the brain, we feel good. But a lot of the reason we might be feeling so clear is because we have a potential modulation in neuroinflammation within the brain. The journal Obesity published a study where they had mice fast for 24 hours and they found that they had a reduction in interleukin-1 alpha in the cortex region of the brain as well as the hippocampus region of the brain. These are strongly associated with neuroinflammation within the brain. When that's modulated, your brain can function and fire a little bit better. Okay, they also saw an increase in ghrelin, the hunger hormone, which is strongly associated with cognition because when you're hungry, you go into survival mode and your brain lights up so that you can survive. Okay, so there we have it. We have the five things. We have the pro-inflammatory immune cells that are modulated. Okay, we have the modulation of the NLRP3 inflammasome via ketones. We have the modulation of the histamine response and the degranulation when it comes to allergies. Then we have the inhibition or the preventing of the transcribing or the binding of nuclear factor kappa B to the DNA. And last, we have that modulation in neuroinflammation within the cortex and the hippocampus region of the brain. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.